Okay, um, I see Des has had up impressions of the John Smith collection, but I think it's also recent events concerning this collection, because I think generally the collection's been known about for 50 odd years now, but very few people have had a chance to actually see it in the flesh. Um, just talking to several people tonight, they say they had, had got in touch with John and um, asked him if they could go and have a look and he said yes. So they went out there. So it, a lot of people have said that he was a reclusive person, but I don't think he was that reclusive. I think he just got sick to death of tyre kickers who wanted to come out and bloody see what they could find. So um, anyway, with John's death, of course, on the 7th of July last year, um, the collection has probably come more into the public focus. And that's because, of course, he has such a collection and it is, a lot of the aircraft in it are quite rare now. So his family have um, got together with um, the people at the Omaka Aviation Centre and they've come on board as guardians of this collection to help the family um, sort it out, do what needs to be done and get the aircraft to a point where they can be viewed and seen by anybody who is interested in them. So George, who is John's older brother, he's actually 88, said that like most wartime families in England, they live close to an airport and in their case it was RAF Finningley at Doncaster in South Yorkshire. And they were close to aeroplanes before they emigrated to New Zealand. So I guess that's where John got a lot of his background information and perhaps his um, passion for them. Even his family is unsure what actually drove his passion. He's just one of those things, they, they believe that he wanted to rescue these things before they disappeared completely. So that was what started John on the steps towards his collection. His first acquisition was in 1955, and at that time he would have been 20 years old. He put in a tender for one of the RNZ AF mosquitoes, and he was successful. So we don't know what price he paid for it, but I suspect that it wasn't very much, if you think about it in terms today. And he started with that aircraft and he persevered and collected other aircraft on top at a later stage. To move the mosquito from where it was at Woodburn, he had to actually cut it up. And he took the, the outer wing panels off just outboard of the undercarriage. He cut the fuselage into about three parts and he transported them by his tr own trusty truck from Woodburn to Marpur. And if you think about that road and what it would have been like in the 50s, you can imagine it would have been quite a job for him to do that, especially being a 20 or 21 year old. So um, he was certainly keen and he knew what he was up to. Most of the, the uh, airframes in the collection have come from the area around Tasman, Marlborough area but that wasn't the only place that he got airframes from. The two P-40 Kitty Hawks were actually purchased by John from Asplund's garage, and he did this in the mid-60s. Now, I've seen two different dates, and they're about two or three years apart, but somewhere around about the mid-60s. And again, he drove his trusty truck all the way from Marpur up to Rugahia to pick these aircraft up and he ended up making about six or seven trips to get the airframes and all the, all the other bits that he found in the paddock or in the, the sheds that related to those aircraft. Some of the airframes would, were disassembled correctly. In other words, they were unbolted. Some of them were not. The P-51, unfortunately, had the wings torched off or cut off just outboard of the undercarriage again. So that now creates a problem for the person who has taken this on. The, must uh, the mosquito, as I said, he did himself. And being a carpenter, he did it 
the way he knew he could get the thing back together again. And if you look at the machine now, it's difficult to understand how he cut that thing up into sections that he could move and then put it back together with a point. Now, I went round that wing and had a look and I couldn't tell where he'd cut that thing. But, and you know, it's obviously strong enough. It, it wasn't just a um, cosmetic repair because that wing has been lifted up, put onto a truck, transported from Mapua to Omaka, and it's sitting on a, tr a uh, big dolly now so they can move it round and um, do all their cleaning and um, restoration work on it. So it was certainly, when he put it back together, it was certainly the way it should have been and had plenty of strength in it. Over the decades, and this is something I got from a magazine recently, over the decades, aviation collectors, enthusiasts and historians from New Zealand and overseas have made a sort of pilgrimage to our Mapua to see these increasingly rare aircraft. And the comment here was that John Smith remained a reclusive character and potential buyers were often left disappointed. I don't know that he was that reclusive. I think he could just pick the tyre kickers from the people who were serious about it. And the other thing that he was real serious about was that he wanted these aeroplanes to remain in New Zealand. He didn't want them sold to somebody who was going to make a profit on the damn things and fire them off overseas. And that's come through recently again with the family. The family were keen to see a lot of these aircraft remain in Mapua if possible. But unfortunately, there's no buildings there suitable or could be built suitable to um, display these. So hence the reason why most of the collection has now gone to Omaka, because the aviation historic uh, collection is there. They have the buildings and a lot of those aircraft are going to be integrated into the existing items in that museum for display. And I would imagine that when they get put in there, that is going to be a real draw card for that whole area. As I said, the family, when John passed away, the family rallied around and very carefully considered John's wishes in relation to his collection. And they didn't rush into anything. They got involved with the people from the aviation, um, Omaka Aviation Heritage Centre, and they were pulled in to help them make the right decisions with regard to this collection. At least two of the Harvard airframes have been sold to Auckland interests and have recently gone to uh, Ardmore. The P-51, um, as we come along, um, we'll give you some more information on these. But the P-51, as you probably all know, has now been sold to um, Brendan Deer. And Brendan is restoring the thing to flying condition. So it'll be one of the most historic and complete uh, P-51s. Um, and it'll be a real time capsule of New Zealand um, RNZF aircraft from the 50s. The main aircraft making up the collection were a P-40E1 NZ3043, a P-40N20 NZ3220, the North American P-51D25 NZ2423, the DH-98 Mosquito FB6 NZ2336, the Lockheed Hudson 3A NZ2049, two Harvards that I'm aware of, I think there might have been more than that, or parts are more than that in there, NZ909 and NZ1068. John's own private um, de Havilland Tiger Moth, BQB, and several vampire fuselages that you would have picked up in some of those earlier pictures. There is also quite a substantial um, spares package of stuff that John had collected that were relevant to a lot of these aircraft. And I know that Brendan has collected a lot of that stuff now and they're sorting through everything they've got and stuff that they thought they were missing and would have trouble finding have come to light in the, in the spares package that they've got from the um, estate. Recently on my uh, trip down to Blenheim in October of this year, I got in touch with Mike Nichols who along with John Sanders 
is one of the main people involved in moving this collection right from day one. So he arranged for me to get access to the uh, hangars where these aircraft are now currently stored and being worked on. So we will go through some of these aircraft now just to give you a bit of background to them so that you can see, and what I've done is I've pulled up pictures from the WANS website. Now, I don't know whether most of you know, I'm sure you do, that the WANS website has a lot of threads on there. And there's one thread on there at the moment for the John Smith collection. And it currently has something like 569 comments and 61,900 views. And there are heaps of historic photos and all sorts of stuff on there. So if you're interested in finding out some more about these aircraft, go onto the WANS website and look for the John Smith collection thread. There's heaps of information on there. OK, Curtis P-40E Kitty Hawk NZ-3043, ex-US Air Force 41-36410, and ex-RAF EV-156. First came into 17 Squadron RNZAF, and we don't have dates for all of this, unfortunately. It then went to number two OTU at Ohakia, where it was coded FEB. It was sold to John Larson at Rugahir on the 2nd of March 1948, and it was one of the last four Kitty Hawks left to be melted down when John managed to get his hands on it. So they were still extant. At, um, Rooker here in March of 1967. So I was told mid 60s, this one says 67, so somewhere in that sort of ballpark. And at that point in time, of course, it went to John Smith at Mapua. Dave Homewood has done some um, checking on various World War II pilots' logbooks, and he's discovered that Jeff Fiskin, who we all know is the pilot of NZ3072. Uh, named Wairarapa Wildcat, actually spent more time flying this aircraft than he did the Wairarapa Wildcat itself. So um, he has quite a bit of history with this aircraft as well. This aircraft was moved from uh, Mapua to o um, Omaka on the 6th of February. So it was one of the first aircraft to come away from the Mapua area. And it's there currently um, being cleaned up. My understanding of what they're doing is they're not going to completely restore these things. They're going to keep them as much as they can, but make them presentable. Because a lot of this stuff, as you can see, a lot of those colours are the original World War II uh, markings. And there's been quite a bit of um, comment and, um, well, not so much argument, but people have disagreed over the various colours and, and the proportions and all sorts of things. Well, here it is in the flesh, and there's no, um, no arguing with these. So my understanding is they're going to clean these up and leave a lot of this, um, the markings and that as they are, so they don't move away from them and destroy what's already there. It appears that this aircraft might have had a name of Bess, as there are pictures around showing the uh, uh, RNZF aircraft with the name Bess on the lower port cowl. And the um, inscription on the back of the photo was that it was NZ3043. But you can't see the rego of the aircraft in the same picture as the name on it. So we, they believe that um, it does have the name of Bess. You want to, that's about all of you want to get through those, dears. As I said, I've just picked out about nine or ten photos for each of these aircraft. There are heaps more photos on the thread, so if you want to have a look at various aspects of it, go on to that uh, website, and um, there's plenty there to look at. That photo, that previous photo there with the red in the... Um, markings on the tail, I always thought that they got rid of the red very quickly and I assumed that it meant the um, markings on the fin as well. But here's this thing here and there's pictures of the Avenger that we've recently done that have that red marking on it. 
And I thought they'd got rid of that before the, you know, long before the end of the war, but there's proof that it wasn't necessarily so. Okay, the next aircraft up is the Curtis P40N-20, Kitty Hawk NZ3220, ex-US Air Force 43-22962. This was assembled at number one aircraft depot at Hobsonville and brought on charge at that station on the 4th of November 1943. It was originally coded G and as such, it acquired the name of Glory Alliance. And it was actually the third P-40 to carry that name. Now, I've got a few notes a bit further on, so I'll come back to that in a minute. It was sold to Larson again at Rugger here on the 2nd of March, 1948. And again, somewhere around that time, John Smith acquired it and moved it down to Mapua. This aircraft uh, was moved from the Mapua collection on the 21st of January this year. The aircraft is the last of three Kitty Hawks to be named Glory Alliance after a young Christchurch girl who was in hospital with TB. She started corresponding with some, a couple of young members of 4SU based in New Georgia at the time, round about January of 1944. She became the unit's mascot and inside the aircraft there was a written note that was pasted onto the instrument panel reminding the pilots of their responsibility towards the aircraft. Unfortunately it wasn't, didn't always end up being a great um, saviour for the aircraft. One particular pilot wrote off the first two aircraft inside a month, by the look of it about three weeks. So it wasn't necessarily a good omen for the aircraft. There was also a fourth aircraft that ended up with the name of Glory Alliance, but that was actually a F4U Corsair. And it was operated um, by 23 Squadron, but again 4SU with a servicing unit for it. But at that time they were based in uh, Los Negros from the 14th of November 1944. That's um, John's brother there, George his son and his wife, and Mike Nichols. This was the aircraft was displayed at Christchurch. Um, I think it was part of a war, burn, uh, war bonds um, event, and it was actually towed through the streets early one morning from Wigram into the square. They put the wings back on it, and it was there, but it was only there for one day and they were hoping that Young Glory Alliance could come down and actually view her aircraft. But unfortunately it rained that day and it wasn't possible. But there's some talk around that the next morning, quite early, they managed to get her out of bed and get her down to see the aircraft before they actually towed it back to Wigram. So it's possible she did see it in the end in the flesh. As you can see, in the short time they've had the thing there, they've done an amazing amount of work. This air, these two aircraft, both the P-40s, are in John Saunders' hangar, and he's got his own aircraft in there, which is a P-40E, that he's in the process of restoring, which I understand was a wreck that came out of Russia quite some time ago. Okay, the next aircraft up is the P-51 Mustang, NZ-2423, US number 45-11513. It was shipped to New Zealand from the US on the Dominion Park. It was received at the Aircraft Assembly Depot at Hobsonville on the 27th of August 1945, so it was within days of the end of the war. The item was placed in rubberized storage at Hobsonville in early 46. I have no idea what rubberized storage is. I don't know whether anybody here knows. I really don't have a clue what that means. It was transferred to Ardmore by barge and road in February of 47 and remained cocooned until um, early 1952. 
It was then flown into storage at number one repair depot, Ruka here, in August of 52. Subsequently, the thing was flown to, or moved to number two, TAF Squadron, which is a Wellington, on the 12th of July, 1954. And it was in service from that point to the 25th of October, 55. It then went to 42 Squadron, Oharkia, in October of 55 for fighter, fighter affiliation, drogue towing, communications and continuation flying. It was finally withdrawn from service in early 57. This aircraft made the last RNZF Mustang flight from Oharkia to Woodburn on the 30th of May 1957, prior to being stored at Woodburn from the 30th of July that year. It was finally sold by Government Stores Board Tender 5926 to a W Ruffles in Blenheim in May of 58. And in 60, 1964, John Smith acquired the aircraft and moved it to Marpua. This was one of 30 Mustangs received from the RN, by the RNZAF in 1945, but the end of the war meant that they were put in storage until at least 1951 when they were used by the four territorial squadrons. The ma majority were um, withdrawn from service in 55, and most of them were sold for scrap in 1958. Um, this aircraft has subsequently been sold to Brendan Deere, and he has started work to restore this aircraft to flying status. There is a separate, that's Brendan Deere there with George Smith. I don't know whether he's signing the cheque or just looking happy about the fact that he's acquired it. Uh, again, there's a separate uh, thread on the WANS website for this, and it, uh, it's being updated quite frequently by Brendan himself. As the, at the moment, of course, they're um, disassembling the thing and getting it ready to start cleaning, finding out what they're short of, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're looking for more information on that, it's available on the WANS website. I guess the, the big problem with it is going to be the, the wing, and I don't know whether they can rebuild the wing from the stub that they've got. I guess it's possible. All it needs is dollars and heaps of them. So I guess that'll be one of the things that uh, Brendan is thinking about at this point in time. He's probably making inquiries to see whether there are any wings, complete wings around that uh, might be a better deal. So uh, I guess time will tell. But certainly when this aircraft's complete, it's going to be a, um, the most complete and um, original P-51 Mustang, certainly in New Zealand. Just looking at that photo of the instrument panel, I understand when John got the Mosquito that the RNZAF had removed most of the instruments, most of the cockpit in, um, accessories out of the aircraft. And yet if you look at the thing now, everything is there. It appears that John spent quite some time ratting through stores, and I guess he talked to people at the RNZAF to find out what was available, and that aircraft is actually complete. If you look at it today, you wouldn't know that none of that stuff was in there at the time he acquired it. So. Um, he certainly spent some time on it. Again, Mike, Mike Nichols there with um, Brendan. Okay. As you can see, there are quite a few aircraft or photos around of NZ2423 and amongst all the other ones, but it's amazing how many original shots there are of that particular aircraft. Even one in colour. Mm -hmm. Okay, the DH-98 Mosquito, FB-6, NZ-2336, and it was XT-910. It was built by Standard Motors, and was delivered to 27 Maintenance Unit on the 19th of November 1945. This is in the UK. It was subsequently ferried from the UK by an RAF, RNZAF crew 
and brought on charge at Ohakia on the 28th of April 1947. It was ferried to Woodburn for storage shortly after arrival. At some point it was removed from storage and placed on strength of 75 Squadron. It was then, um, where are we? It was placed in storage again at Woodburn on the 22nd of April 1952 and declared surplus on the 30th of June 55 and sold by Government Stores Board tender 6326 to John Smith. Airframe hours at the time of disposal were 80.35 hours. Although the aircraft was broken into parts for transport to Smith's farm, it was later reassembled and is stored at Marpur. Well, we've seen the pictures of it. So he did a brilliant job of putting that aircraft back together. But can you imagine towing that thing on a, with a small truck up some of the metal roads between Omarka and Marpur in the 1950s? Would have been quite a job. This aircraft was moved from Mapua to Ohaka on the 27th of September this year with the team involved in preparation, uh, disassembly and preparation of the aircraft for transport as virtually a who's who of mosquito restoration in New Zealand. Um, Warren Denham and two of his fellow people were down there. If you see any blue stands around, those are the stands that um, Warren has built for the uh, to use in the rebuild or the new build of the mosquitoes that he's working on, and he's also got a stand there. And that's, I'm not sure whether it's any of oh, the, well, there's one of the pictures of the um, the stand that was Warren built. There's also one that he uses for the two engines, and the two engines actually bolt back to back on the stand, so they and they're moved as one unit. We saw, we saw a stand like that. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I put the picture in here as one of these ones. Mm, okay. This airframe, and you'll see a picture of it coming up, has an original Coastal Command strike camera in it, and apparently that is exceedingly rare. And some people believe that there's none others available or are around in the world, and we have one sitting in the front of this aircraft. So, um, and during the, the rubbing down recently, within the last month or so, the team have come across the name of Peggy scratched into the paintwork. So all three of the big aircraft from John's collection now have names. So the two P-40s and the Mosqui uh, Mosquito. So this is one of the pictures, that wing is a single piece wing and you can see the length of it transported there. So that thing was cut into three sections by John back in 1955. So he did a brilliant job in putting that back together again. And this is the point where it arrived at Omarka and again it was craned off. And it just sits on the floor on a cradle and um, they're currently in there working on it. There it is there. And I don't know, I've looked, I wandered around that wing and had a look at it and I could not see any cut marks or any repair marks, so he did a, a brilliant job with it. And as you can see, they've, they've already got the tail section rubbed down, prepared and painted. So um, they're not wasting time with it. And you can see how complete that cockpit is. And yet reports I've seen said that the RAF stripped virtually everything out of the, um, certainly the instruments out of that cockpit. Well, there's the back end of that strike camera there. There's a picture, I think, of the front of it, uh, the next one up. So that's that big round thing at the top of that cowl is the lens of the strike camera. So apparently there's, people have said that there's no others anywhere in the world. So there's the back end. Mm. Those are the undercarriage legs. 
they look a bit grotty, but uh, the way they work through them, and uh, you know, the aircraft has been sitting on them until it came up to our marker, so um, I guess they'll be cleaned up and put back on there. And those 303 barrels sticking out of there, somebody down in Omarka has set up their CNC lathe and turned up those to put on display for the aircraft. Okay, and the last of the aircraft we'll talk about tonight is the Lockheed Hudson Mark 3A NZ2049 XUS41-36976, an XRAF. FH-175. This aircraft was shipped to New Zealand on the Kookaburra. It was assembled at Number 1 Aircraft Depot Hobsonville and brought on charge on the 2nd of April 1942. It went to 3GR Squadron at Whanuapai in April of 42, then to 2BR Squadron at Ohakia, then to 9BR Squadron with a detached flight at Whanuapai in January of 44. It then went to number one repair depot at uh, Ruga here in December of 43. And then in April of 44, it was moved out and they started converting it to a C-63 transport aircraft. It went to number 40 uh, transport squadron at Fenuapai, then 41 transport squadron on the 15th of August 44. It was drawn from, withdrawn from use in June of 45 and stored at Woodburn in 46. It was sold by tender to a Mr Edwards in uh, December of 47 and subsequently sold to John Smith who moved it to his collection. Now this aircraft was sold to Bill Reid back about 2007 whilst his team were actually still working on the Anson. Uh, was surveyed for rebuild, but because the wings had been torched off right up close to the fuselage, Lockheed had told them that there was no way in hell they were ever going to repair it. They needed a complete wing for it. And um, the price of that, if they could find one, was just way out of reach. So at that point in time, Bill decided that he wasn't going to go any further with that. And the aircraft has subsequently been on display at the Yamaka Aviation Museum. Uh, and I think it went there about five, six years ago. So this is, they've set it up in the diorama in the uh, museum. It's like an ad, as crashed or as found crashed aircraft. Very well done, looks very realistic. And um, they certainly spent some time on it. But unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we see that aircraft restored any further than that. OK. OK. All right, well that's it from me at the moment. Um, hopefully the photos will give you some idea of the, the aircraft that John collected, the work that's now been undertaken and the care that is being given to them. And I would imagine within the next year or so, um, we're gonna have some great aircraft on display at the Omarka Aviation Hist uh, Historic Society. It takes people with vision and determination to succeed in making these projects and they become such a windfall for enthusiasts year after the fact and John certainly had that in spades. I believe that Graham uh, often is writing a full story on the collection and its movement and it should appear in the next issue of Classic Wing so hopefully we'll have some follow up to what we've spoken about tonight. So that's it from me. I've got a question. <laughs> What's that? It's a um, rear turret. Oh, under yeah, drop, yeah, it dropped down. And I think you can actually see a 303 in it. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, sticking yeah. out the back, yeah. Yeah, I know, I don't ever... Well, I've heard about them, never actually seen a picture of one. So if anyone wants to look at one of the photos and ask a question about it, we can probably find it. 
All right, any questions? Mike, what's the condition of those, those Goblin engines? Did you look at them? I believe that they, they were not as good as our ones. They were quite dusty. Somebody has bought them or bought all the vampire spares. Dave Homewood knows who it is, but the person has asked not to be named at this point in time, so it's not for um, publication as to who actually has them. And you're on the competition with us, I think. Well, I don't know what he intends to do with them. I don't even know who it is. <laughs> he can't beat us for numbers. <laughs> so how did they take the wings off the Mustang just for an axe or something, don't they? Yeah, well, it's been cut off, yeah. um, and I don't know how. They'd probably gas axe or something. Just... Yeah, uh, so they cut through all the spars and everything and just drop them off. And I don't know whether the actual outer panels from it are still around anywhere. I've not seen any photos of them and not seen any mention of them, so I presume they disappeared into the scrap heap. That, um, Gavin Conway gave us a talk remember about the downstairs yeah. regarding that and said that the, the smell in them in the mosquito was to be believed. <laughs> years and years of rats and, uh, and mice uh, and uh. whatever. But it's just amazingly little damage in there. If you look inside it now, you know, you get rats in there and they usually chew into the wiring and all sorts of things. Uh, I couldn't see anything that looked as if it had been all chewed up. This aircraft, as some of the other pictures in there, one of them shows the rear uh, in, the, up in the wing cutout looking backwards that shows the inside of the fusage. I haven't put it in the slot. But there's a three gallon uh, freshwater tank in there that was filled for every time it went flying so that if they crashed anywhere, they always had fresh water with them or three gallons of it anyway. So I imagine that this is the picture that there. No, it's, it's in the rear fusage. It's quite a no, big no, tank. No, but I mean, oh, okay. The, you see the yeah. The wing cut out. Mm, look yep. Forward. Looking forward. So you can actually stand in there and take some pictures of the uh, whole cockpit. So the canopy is complete? Yes. Yep. I don't. It didn't look yellow. Um, so looks like it's. But it's been inside all this time. So, you know, it's out there usually yellow up if the thing's outside in the weather all the time. But if you have a look at the cockpit on it there, the, the glazing looks to be all in amazingly good condition. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. All righty.